I'm Maya Bird David, and today I'm going to be presenting lectures 11 and 12 that cover the time period of 1790 until the 1860s. During this time period, there were vast changes in American society. And if a person were to be frozen in, in 1790 and then defrosted in 1860, a lot of aspects of society would be, di would be different. For example, this person would see the growth of churches and the amount of them and the amount of religions. They'd see changes in institutions like jails, poorhouses, orphanages, asylums, mental institutions. Their um, art would be different. Women's rights and roles would be different. Um, changes in attitudes towards slaves like the abolition movement and um, antebellum uh, um, slavery, antebellum reform would be different too. The first topic we're going to be covering is the Second Great Awakening. The Second Great Awakening is when religious leaders um, held revivals in order to um, increase church attendance because it had been declining. And it peaked in the 1820s and, er eight, and early 1830s when Reverend Charles um, G. Finney held revivals in New York and New York City. Basically, the ideas that reverends held in to, uh, in order to do these revivals is that people that didn't convert to Christianity or weren't more religious or didn't attend churches were going to sit, were going to um, were going to hell but they did promise that they would go to heaven if they um, completed these revivals and joined them Christianity became a very central aspect of American society and it actually grew tremendously since the 1840s I mean in the 1840s this is Charles G. Finney and this is in the uh, picture of a revival. And this chart actually demonstrates how great the, um, how the influx of um, churches grew so much during the Second Great Awakening. Okay, um, they basically, it created separation between Christians and heathens, heathens being other religions that weren't as major. And the idea of you're going to heaven or hell, and you have to choose which one you want to go to. Um, to get a lot of people to listen, they'd have preaching tours, and they'd have literature and technological change. Here's another photo of, um, I mean, um, an art piece of a revival. So even though the Second Great Awakening mostly influenced Christianity and its growth, there were also other religions that grew and were um, and fluctuated, um, such as Christian perfectionists, which were a certain a group of Christians. Utopian communities grew. Um, a new religion called um, the Mormons grew, um, developed, and also um, smaller um, groups such as Seventh Day Adventists, Jehovah Witnesses. Jewish reforms and conservatives. In relation to Christian perfectionism, it basically is where people saw individuals and communities to at their highest peak. So they believe that they can reach perfection. And it basically, um, it means that old reforms move to newer and radical direction, which means that they believe that they can get to the furthest spot, they can be the most reformed. Here's another image of a revival. So utopias, there were about 100 reform communities that were called utopias. Um, they were different in structure that, and motivation than other societies, at, than American societies at the time. Uh, they had different leadership roles, they had, some had strong leaders and others had like a more um, group leadership role. Um, some were inspired by the market revolution's changes because they wanted to counteract them. They didn't like what the market, market revolution provided for American society. And it also attracted those that wanted to redeem themselves from the sinful ways that they had before. Here's an example of a shaker society, which I'm gonna be addressing in a few slides. I mean, a shaker utopia. So utopian goals were basically to restore social harmony and make it more cooperative and establish their own communities. They wanted to make the middle class greater and bring the rich and the poor together. Um, they wanted they wanted gender to be equal and 
not they didn't like the normal marriage patterns that had um that were normal for american society most wanted to abolish private property and even though their ideas um were popular among the time very few utopias remained um present and alive after the second great awakening so the shakers like i showed you the image before um, it was actually the most successful religious communities, and it was in New York, and Mother Anne Lee established it. Their beliefs were that dual personality in which God is both male and female, which backed up their uh, belief that men and women should be equal and their work should be equal. And even though they believed that their work should be equal, they were still separated by sex. So men would work on one side, women would work on the other side. Um, instead of mating and having kids to grow their population, they actually attracted converts and adopted orphans. They abolished private property and traditional marriage. Here's an image. They actually got their name, the Shakers, by their dance. The Oneida. They were, um, this is another utopian society founded by John Humphrey Noyes in upstate New York. And he believed that um, a p person could, believe, could achieve moral perfection which is similar to Christian perfectionism ideals, and he wanted to preach sinlessness to other people. The Utopian Society actually believed that they should form a single holy family and complex marriage in which a man could impose sexual interactions with women, but with their, con with their consent. The Oneida Utopian Society also abolished private property. And this is the um, house in which they stayed. The American Temperate Society was actually um, a group that wanted to uh, um, reduce the amount of drinking because there was a problem of that in the United States. Uh, they wanted, they persuaded people to stop drinking and basically they um, told them that they were sinful and that if they didn't, um, if they didn't stop sinning that they'd go to hell. And um, it actually uh, made the consumption of alcohol by Americans decrease dramatically very quickly. Um, the Washington Society or the Washington the Washingtonians held gathering about um, reform drinkers, so like a group talking about their previous sins and how they want to change them. And it actually separated non-drinkers and drinkers at the time because those that were non-drinkers believed at the time that um, it was sinful and that they'd go to hell and they were trying to influence um, drinkers, but the drinkers believed that they were being moral and disagreed. Okay, the Mormons was a religion that was developed during this time by um, Joseph, Joseph Smith, who actually um, wrote the Book of Mormon. The, um, they were also called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and they believed in no separation of church and state and polygamy in which one man has more than one wife. So um, Smith's successor, or when Smith dies, who will take over for him, was Brigham Young. And he led more than 10,000 people across the Great Plains and Rocky Mountains to Utah. And that's where a lot of Mormons had stayed at the time. So here is an, um, the cover of a movie or a play. And this is actually the Book of Mormon. And it says, Another Testament of Jesus Christ. So in conclusion about the Second Great Awakening and what it influenced, is that religion became customizable to each person's belief. Um, and also it spilled over to other religions, not just Christianity. So now there were different forms of Judaism that had developed as well, like Orthodox, Conservative, and Reformed Jews. Um, also started new religions such as the Mormons. And the boundaries of religion were now let down as people were able to choose what they want to do, and most people did choose religion. So moving on to the second ideal, um, the second change, it was changes in institutions. So there was a reform in institutions in which jails, poorhouses, asylums, schools, orphanages were actually funded and were given more attention to because they believed that um, human a humane aspects should be applied. This is Dorothy Dick. She was a Massachusetts school teacher, and she actually believed that um, she was an advocate for humane treatment of the mentally ill and believed that the pe that mental asylums and institutions should be treating their patients like humans and not like animals or like crazy. So this is an, um, a paint, uh, an art piece 
of what a mental institution was before the reform, how it was very unorganized, people were treated very inhumanely, and um, Dorothy Dix had wanted to change this. Horace Mann, who was a lawyer and a Whig politician, he was, um, he was a public education advocate, and he believed that free and universal education was to be for everyone, and that um, it should be based on professional, professional trained teachers. So moving on to the third section, which is liberty and democratic values, um, we focus on the Transcendentalists, which were actually a group of New England intellectuals. Um, they, they were seeking economic advancement and personal development, in which they could become the best people that they could be. And um, it offered a new definition of Jefferson's pursuit of happiness, in which people like Ralph Walder Emerson wrote that it was the one important revolution that was the new value of the private man. This is a picture of him. And transcendentalism was kind of the perfect balance between God, man, and nature. Art was also a very big change that occurred during this time period in which, for example, the Hudson River School art movement was developed. It was basically inspired by Romanticism and it was led by Thomas Cole, um, in which it embodied a group of landscape painters in which they painted um, imagery of the Hudson River Valley, Valley, Valley sorry. And um, the most common attributes of these paintings included like calm, natural, peaceful, and like a romanticism in which it's super gorgeous. And um, here are some more um, images and paintings that are very beautiful and supposed to amplify happiness and relaxation. When it, goes to, um, when it comes to democracy, Alexis de Tocqueville was um, a European that actually visited America and he was observing the changes in um, democracy at the time and the political transformation. Um, he disliked democracy, but he did include how voting did, was not democracy. He believed that democracy was a part of American freedom and should be required by everyone. So the fourth topic is changes in women's peoples and rights. The cult of domesticity was basically after um, the market revolution, uh, like a, a lot of years after, um, opportunities were seized. And there was a new definition of femininity in which women were just used for their sexuality and um, beauty. And it basically meant that they should own private environments and it should be away from the economy. Virtue, which is a political characteristic of men in the Republican government, basically meant that women were just used for fertility, beauty, and they were dependent on men and shouldn't be working by themselves. Um, because of this, women, uh, the American birth rate dropped, which in which women made the conscious decision to stop having children. The Seneca Falls Convention was organized by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott, and they were both veterans of anti-slavery crusade. Um, it was a gathering in upstate New York, uh, basically spreading the awareness that women's rights needed to grow and that they needed to have the same rights as men, saying that they changed the words all men created equal to all women and men created equal so that they were the same level as men. Uh, Sarah and Angelina Grimke were twins. Um, were, I mean, my bad, they were sisters. And they were actually Quakers, and then they wanted, they were uh, abolitionist people. Uh, they actually lectured on slavery and its abolition and their beliefs, but they weren't the first woman to do this. Like, it was pretty common at the time. Um, Sarah actually published letters of the equality of the sexes, and it called for equal rights of the women, similar to the women at the Seneca Falls Convention's ideas. Here's some pictures of the sisters. Um, so there was also a change in um, attitude towards slavery, like the abolition movement and antebellum reform. So the abolitionist movement actually drew on religious convictions that slavery was a sin and that all racism should be removed from America. And that's like every form of racism. David Walker, who's a free black man, actually wrote an appeal to the colored citizens of the world basically called on black Americans, telling them that there has to be a change in the, in the treatment of them and abolition. And here's uh, the image. 
So Nat Turner's Rebellion was a rebellion that happened in Southampton country, County, Virginia, and it was just um, African Americans rebelling against their slave owners, and it resulted in growing fear in the South. Um, slaves were, a lot of slaves were executed. Um, it played a significant role in implicating the Civil War, like influencing people's ideas, and actually prohibited education to blacks, which was a very um, unfortunate event and decreased people's education. Here's an image that Frederick Douglass, Frederick Douglass, excuse me, was born into slavery and actually escaped slavery when he was young. Um, he was the most influential African American in the 19th century and he was the advocate of racial equality. After freeing himself, he actually lectured many people about the struggles that he went through and um, he actually was part of the campaign for women's rights. He argued that slaves were truer to the nation's ideals rather than white people were. Paternalism was an idea um, and it was a feature of American slavery in which slave owners would treat their slaves better. They gave them improvement, which kind of contradicts the Nat Turner's Rebellion. Um, it diminished cultural gap in which um, slave owners included their slaves in more private gatherings, like with their family, they'd include them. Um, because the slave trade closed, it became more, slaves became more a part of their um, family because they couldn't get new slaves, so they connected more. And actually, paternalism was kind of just an excuse for slave owners to feel good about themselves for including slaves. And they felt like they were actually reforming when truly it was literally sort of similar and the same. Okay, so peculiar institution was what, what the Southerners and the Southern areas called the North because the North was more progressive and was part of the antebellum reform. And um, it was growing more than the so South and Western areas. Um, yes, um, Southern slaves, um, Southern slave owners defended slavery saying that it was part of um, the white man's freedom to have slaves. And King Cotton, was um, a phrase used by Southerners to defend their case of slavery in which cotton that was grown by Southern slaves was used by Northerners. So Southerners said that, well, we need cotton and so do the Northerners, so we should have slaves. And here's the book by Stamp. So there were um, two major types of resistance that were daily and running away. The um, daily was just like disruption, like faking that you're ill or stealing food, just disrupting everything that happens in a normal slave a slave's day. Running away was mostly the Underground Rail Railroad, which was an organization of houses that actually led slaves to freedom by letting pe by people letting slaves stay in their house and moving them on on their journey to freedom. Um, there were also oh I forgot to include this. There were also revolts, in which um like Nat Turner's Rebellion, in which people would gather and march with the city and destroy property and hurt people. Here's an image of um, the Underground Railroad in play. The American Colonization Society was the idea that they would, that people would deport Africans at the time to Liberia. And it was actually an outpost of American influence, like even the capital of Liberia at the time was influenced by an American name. Um, it was supported by political leaders, um, people outside of America, like Europe and stuff, thought it was outrageous and unbelievable that this was their solution to getting rid of, Amer of um, African Americans. Um, Northerners and Southerners both believed that it was a good um, decision because they were scared of African American people at the time. They thought they were a danger to them. Instead of... Um, um, helping Amer um, African Americans, they actually inspired them to make a difference in which like over 3,000 um, African Americans um, assembled to create the first National Black Convention. And here's um, an image of the Colonization Society. William Garrison actually um, published The Liberator, which is a really well-known weekly newspaper that influenced ideas of anti-slavery before the Civil War. Uh, he used moral suasion, which is actually the appeal to morality. So basically telling, like, is treating an African-American this way moral? Is it something that you would want to be treated this way? He was a, a very against slavery at the time, and he suggested that the North repeal the Constitution that stated that slaves were legal. 
Um, the gag rule was that the House of Representatives were able to ban petitions about abolition of slaves, and he was completely against that, as most abolitionist were, uh, abolitionists were. Here's an image of him. So there were two major abolitionist parties, and that was the Liberty and Free Soil, Soil parties. Um, the Liberty Party was that abolitionists came together um, to form a political party. And even though they were abolitionists and so was Garrison, he, they actually opposed his ideas because they wanted to actually create change um, through pol politi politics and he was non-political. The Free Soil Party's um, purpose, they were also abolitionists, they were to oppose the expansion of slavery into the West. This is similar to the Northwest Ordinance in which um, slavery was uh, prohibited in new states that were in the West, but this is like a, um, abolishing all slavery in the West and um, not allowing it to spread. Slave power's thesis was the idea that slave owners had too much power over their slaves and over everyone else and that their power should be diminished. In conclusion, the 18th and 19th, 19th century were completely different times. Um, they were it com society completely changed through religion, institution, values, women's rights and rules, and the abolition of slavery. And the change really influenced how America is today. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Have a nice night.